Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Comp 3350 Software Engineering. It's Pi Day. It's Pi Day. Everybody celebrate. Everybody uh, freak out. I don't know. Buy a pie on your way home. Get a pie on your way home. Celebrate Pi Day. Um, I hope you all had a great weekend. Today, we're going to do two things. Uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about is dealing with errors. And I want to look at this from two perspectives. The first perspective is like the technical exception handling in Java. I want to look at it from the perspective of kind of like strategies that we can use for doing exception handling in general and the consequences of doing exception handling in certain ways. So the kinds of things that can happen from that. And then I want to look at errors as presented to an actual person like sitting in front of your app and, and using it. So what are they seeing and what can they do with it? Uh, the other thing that I want to look at is revising plans. So we're kind of in this state where we finished iteration two, we've delivered iteration two, and now we're moving on to iteration three. And uh, one good thing for us to do here is again, to kind of stop and think. So reflect on where we're at right now with the project that we're building and make changes to the planning documentation that we had established in the first place. With that, I want to first spend some time talking about uh, iteration three. So like what's expected of you for this iteration um, and then show you the sample project, how it's been updated, and then do a quick demo of the new kind of testing that you're going to be expected to do for this iteration. So this document is up on the course webpage. You can see this up there right now, as always. There's also a corresponding rubric that's attached to this document, so please take a look at that on your own time. There are two uh, major parts to our iteration three deliverables. The first is, you know, keep going with the project, keep building the project that you've been working on for the last little while. We have similar expectations for iteration three in that you're going to keep working on adding new functionality to work toward the vision that you set up at the beginning of your project with your team. But we also want you to do more kinds of testing this time. So in the last iteration, there was a lot of effort that went into getting a persistence layer change happening. So actually using a real relational database. This time, we want you to actually assess the seams between the layers. So we want you to start doing some integration testing, so between your logic layer and the real HSQLDB persistence layer. We also want you to do system testing now. So we want you to actually do acceptance tests. And we'll talk a little bit about the acceptance tests uh, moving forward. But the basic idea is that you're going to be writing code that will basically simulate user interactions in the user interface. And I'm going to show you a demo of that today um, before we get too far into it. So that's all the project specific stuff. The other half of iteration three is uh, presenting the work that you've done. Historically, historically, this has been in the form of uh, everyone in the team come up to the front of the room, you get the projector, you project at the room, you tell the room about your project. Um, and I would sit there and I would grade all the presentations while people were doing them. And uh, yeah, that was agonizing. That was really awful. Um, I think it's important that you get the opportunity to present and, and celebrate. Like basically you've taken the time to build this project. I want you to go through the effort of, of being able to present the work that you've done so that other people can see, notably me, like what you've accomplished at the end of this uh, project. And the way that I'm looking for you to do that presentation so that we're not all stuck in this room together for two weeks watching presentations is I want you to put together a website that demonstrates what your project is, who your team are, and what you've accomplished throughout the term. Uh, so in terms of the project itself, 
the same general approach as to what you had done before with iteration two is going to happen. So move things from iteration to two into three if you haven't already. Uh, add new features and new user stories. And then what you're going to be doing is uh, building up some new test suites. The test suites that you're going to be building for iteration tests and system tests have to also test the work that you've done already. So you're going to have to write new tests for um, stuff that you've already done. I also want you to do an actual retrospective activity with your team independently for this iteration. So looking back at what you've done and what you've accomplished. Uh, and I want you to document that retrospective and include it in your um, repository for iteration three. I want you to do integration testing. I want you to update your architecture. I want you to do system testing using something like Robotium or Espresso. Again, I'm going to demonstrate uh, Espresso right uh, after we finish talking about this. And I want you to delete all of your stub implementations. There should not be stub implementations in your project anymore. What I'm looking for you to do is to replace the stub implementations with mock. So use Mockito, use some kind of mocking library to replace all the stubs that you've written. Um, and have that get, send back, have the mocks behave as stub objects. So for each specific test that you've got, have it return test specific data for what you're looking for. Uh, in terms of everything else, the main thing that is uh, different in terms of assessment from the last couple of iterations is that the design part, so smells, code smells, are not marked out of anything this time. So that part of your work is out of zero. Uh, the, this is going to be a kind of a penalty situation. As you're building up this new stuff, your goal should be to strive to make sure that you're doing good design practices. And that means applying design patterns. That means taking a look at the smells that I've identified in the past and making sure that you're not repeating those smells. So making sure that they stay out of the code base that you've got. For the presentation part of this, what I'm looking for is a static website. I'm not looking for you to like build up a web server. I don't want you to necessarily even host this anywhere. I'm just looking for you to build a static website. So making HTML files, you can use something like um, a static site generator if you are ambitious and want to do something like that, but really just basic presentation. I'll note that there's no points on the presentation part for style. There's no points on the presentation part for style. I don't really care how good of a web dev you are. I don't care how good or bad of a web dev you are. I'm a terrible web dev. I am not a web dev person. I don't do front end stuff. I've never done front end stuff and I'm not very good at it. But I do want you to show at least uh, some stuff with your project. So I want you to have a screen recording in there. This can be like an animated GIF or you can use some other kind of um, presentation mechanism, but it has to be some kind of animated thing. Uh, and I'm not going to read through all this stuff, but I'll let you read it on your own. But there are some um, examples that I've got here. So you can click on these links to get a sense of what a website that I'm looking for uh, for this project has. So outside of doing a demo of um, the acceptance testing stuff, are there any questions about iteration three? Okay, my main advice is don't stop working on your project. Don't stop working on your project. Keep working on your project. You don't have to be like feverishly working on it this week for iteration three, but you know, keep the ball rolling, keep things going. Um, because the expectations in terms of the stuff that you have to deliver for iteration three are they're higher than they have been for the last two iterations. So with that in mind, uh, I want to quickly show you um, how the sample project has been updated. So the first place that you need to look in the sample project is the build Gradle for the app. There are new dependencies that have been added to the sample project, um, and they're all related to uh, the mocking libraries, so having a dependency on Mockito, and then also dependencies on Espresso, which is what I am using for uh, system testing for this application. Uh, there are more complex ways to do Espresso than what I'm going to show you. So for example, there's a test recorder that you can use, but that's not something I'm going to be talking about in the class. You can use this if you want, but it's not something that I'm talking about. Uh, my 
approach to this is write them by hand because I'm a Luddite and I just do stuff by hand all the time. The basic idea here is that you'll have a test file that's filled with unit tests or at least methods that are annotated with the test annotation. But the difference between what you've been writing for unit tests before and these system tests is that the code that you see here is basically finding buttons. So this is finding a button that has a very specific ID that's on the page right now and then clicking on that button. So this code is going through the process of interacting with your application as though it is an actual person like tapping on the screen of a tablet. And the idea here is that you want to be able to verify that from the front end all the way to the persistence layer and then all the way back again at the front end. What your buttons do, do what they say they do. So we're trying to verify that that is actually working the way that it's supposed to work. I've got this file open in Android Studio, and I realize that this is quite tiny, but that code part is not the important part that I want to show you here. This test uh, belongs in a different folder. So again, this is really tiny, I'm sorry uh, if you're watching this again later, but I'll point out what I'm pointing at, well, I'll point out what I'm talking about here. There's two test folders that you've got in uh, Android Studio. There's the tests folder, that's where you've been putting all your unit tests, but there's also an Android test folder, and this is where your system tests will go. Once you've got your system tests set up, what's going to happen when you run them, I'm gonna click play here, is that your emulator will start up, and as the app gets installed on the device, it's gonna start like typing stuff in. And I think that's, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm easily pleased, but I think that's amazing to see all this stuff happening like while it's going on. So that's, that's the basic idea of, um, of what's going to be happening with the, with the system testing. We're kind of looking for a similar structure. We want to be able to run all your system tests fairly easily. So as long as we have like a one-click access to running all your system tests, um, that's basically what we're looking for. Okay, all right, we're all good with that. Okay, how many people actually have a pie at home for pie day? Okay, homework for today is stop at the store and buy a pie, or I think they sell tarts and stuff at degrees. Uh, so yeah, go, go pick something up. This is exciting stuff in my house. Like, uh, okay, so. Let's, uh, let's talk about handling errors. Sh shit happens, shit happens, errors happen. You know, it doesn't matter how good you write your code, uh, something's going to go wrong at some point. Something is definitely going to go wrong at some point. And the language that we're using, Java, to do this kind of is a language that has this idea of exceptions and exception handling baked into it from the beginning. This is something that's part of the language. Errors are going to happen and exceptions are going to happen. There's two parts to what we're going to be discussing about handling errors. Dealing with exceptions in code and what errors our user actually sees. I've got these as separate items, but for the first activity that we're going to be doing, I want you to look at this for both of those things. We're gonna be just looking at code, but I'm gonna be asking you to think about what a user might be seeing based on the code that you're seeing in front of you. So we're going straight, we're gonna go straight into this activity. I've got this code up on the course webpage. I've also printed it out and put it in front of everybody. The thing that we're looking at right now is the stapled together sheet that just has a bunch of Java code on it. We're going to step through each of these. I want to step through each of these together, so independent, uh, one after the other. And for each of these different code samples, what I'm looking for you and your team to do is to, uh, to try and answer some questions like, if this code that you're looking at right now were to wind up in the exceptional state. So an exception has happened in the code that you have here, and it's trying to be handled right now. 
what do you, and this is where you're wearing your dev hat, what do you see when that happens? What do you see when that happens in the code that's on this page? Or I can put, I'm going to put the code up on the screen. Actually, I need, I need your opinion here. Uh, is it better for me to leave the questions there on the sheet or the, put the code up on the screen? What would you prefer? Can I split the screen? Yeah, I could. How's that look? Is that okay? Okay. What do you as a dev see? So here's our first example here. If we get into the catch part of this try block, what do you as a dev see? What do you do? So you're in the state, you see something. How do you debug the error? How do you try to figure out what's gone wrong? Now take your dev hat off and put your user hat on. If this is running an, an, on an Android device, so this is the context of our course, if this is running on an Android device, what does your user see if we're in that exceptional state, in the way that the code is right now? Based on what they might see, what can they do? Are they able to fix the problem that's happened? And then the last thing that I want you to think about, put your dev hat back on, is there anything else that can go wrong with the code that's here? So other things that can go wrong, will other exceptions happen? Will something go wrong eventually? Or is this going to be OK in the way that it is right now? So I'm going to give you like three or so minutes for this first example. I'm going to call on Teams for some feedback. And we'll get back together after that and then move on to the next, uh, the next piece of code. You got three minutes? Please go ahead. OK, so let's get back together on this one. Uh, so the team that I'm picking on first uh, for, for this example is uh, team one. Uh, my random number generator, if you were here last time, team five feels like they're being picked on. And uh, my random number generator, I'm going to make this as big as possible. Oh, no, now I've lost it. My random number generator here has team five as the first pick. And I'm just going to give them a pass. So that means that team one is our, our random choice for the first spot. So given this code, uh, team one, what do you as a dev see? Well, the, the sort on the string stack, right? So okay. Where the error happened. And uh, it would also see the type of error. OK. So you'll get the stack trace printed out. The stack trace printing code always prints out like what line of code it's, it's getting the error from. And it prints out what kind of message it's, it's giving you or what kind of exception. Uh, so that's good, great. What would your uh, what would you do to start debugging this? Well, I, I would go to where it says to go. Okay. And just uh, I don't know, put some print statements in there or something. Okay, print statements, breakpoints, something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. What might your user see? So we're putting this on Android right now. What might your user see here? Nothing. They might not even see the app anymore. It might just be like crash. It's gone. Nothing. Or, or alternatively, they click on a button and nothing happens. It just sticks there. Okay. I think that implies the answer to the next question. Can they fix it? There's nothing that they can see to fix. So how are they supposed to fix it? Can anything else go wrong with this code, do you think? For this code, I'm going to say no. There's not much here to go wrong. So uh, I think it's probably safe to say that nothing else is going to go wrong with this. All right. Thank you, team one. Let's uh, move on to number two here. So this is a slightly more involved example. But I'm going to give you the same kind of setup here. So I've got three minutes on my timer. Answer the same questions. Please go ahead. OK. You're good to go? OK. OK. All right, so we're going to get back together here. So uh, I'm picking on team eight this time. So I'm going to I want to give a little bit of context here just to to, to prime you here. Uh, remember that Java is a language that has exceptions baked in, and that means that when you write a method, you can mark it as throws. So you say this method throws something. 
That means that the caller must catch it, they must handle it, or they must rethrow the exception. So risky behavior here has some method call that throws specific exception, and that means that this method either has to catch it or it has to mark itself as throws that specific kind of exception. So I'm picking on team eight, I'm picking on team eight. Given just this code in the state that's it, that it's in right now, we've got this exception state. What do you as a dev see? They see nothing. They see absolutely nothing because it can't happen. It can't happen. So let me give you an idea of what this is because I know I, I have written code like this before. I have personally written code like this before. I've got code in my try block that's like, let's check with a conditional statement to see if this object is null. If it's not null, then try calling a method on it. And then I still catch null pointer exception, but it, it can't happen because that object is not null. I checked it. I guaranteed that that object is not null. That's the idea here. But we get a null pointer exception anyway, because some code that that thing depends on is null, and it raises some null pointer exception. So because this is empty, dev doesn't see anything. So that implies you're the dev, you're sitting there hitting your Android Studio buttons, trying to get something to happen, but just nothing's happening, and you don't see any messages in your log cat. What do you as a dev do to fix the problem? OK. Yeah, so this is where we start either print statements or use your debugger, put a breakpoint at the closest thing to your interaction point. So wherever you're interacting with the code, which is physically the button press, that's a good place. And then start stepping into method calls and see where that crash is happening. Uh, you see nothing as a dev. What does your user see? Nothing, yeah. They can't fix the problem because they don't see anything. The difference between the, actually, there's no difference between the last one and the other one because we're catching in both places. Uh, what other technical things could go wrong with this code? OK. So one piece of advice that I'm going to give you in general is you should just be catching the most specific exception that you're expecting. For the reason of, let other exceptions get handled by somebody else. The technical issue that teammates pointing out, and I think this is fair to point out, if we get null pointer exception raised, which is some other kind of exception or array index out of bounds exception, that's going to get raised somewhere else. And something else is going to have to print out the stack trace or end your app or something. But something has to happen where it's not going to have that specific kind of exception suppressed by us anymore. All right, thank you, teammates. Are we okay with this? Anything else? Anyone else wants to bring up? Yeah. If I'm, can you repeat that, please? Sorry. Um, when I'm if I'm the uh, dev to write this class, yeah, I think I'm assuming to I don't want to debug this. You don't want to debug it. Yeah, that's why I ignore it. <laughs> You don't want to debug it because you want to ignore it. And that could be reasonable that you, you, you know that this exception can happen and you want to ignore it and you don't want to debug it. I'm, I would say you'd still want to at least put something in here, like probably actually like terminate the app because we've gotten into some state that's like, I didn't even expect this to happen. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Okay, good. All right, let's move on to the next one. This one is uh, nearly identical to the last one that you just saw. So I'm only going to give you a couple of minutes. Instead of three, I'm going to give you two to talk about this. The difference here is that we are uh, using a logger to print out the error message as opposed to using uh, print stack trace method. So take two minutes to do this, please. All right. So we're talking to team six this time. So as a dev, we've acknowledged the fact that, OK, maybe this can actually happen. As a dev, uh, team six, what do you see? What do you see as a dev? Um, 
Okay. So we're going to see something. Uh, so for a little bit of context here, again, uh, logger here, this is an object that you, is kind of like printing to your terminal, but it's giving you the ability to do things like filtering. So I can only filter. I only want to actually see error messages in my log. I can suppress everything else. I don't care about warnings or info or anything else. I just want to see error messages. You're going to see something. So you, you as a dev are going to see something. Uh, do What kind of things can you do with that information? Uh, as a dev, what are you going to start to do with that? OK. So print statements, breakpoints. You're going to see at least something in there that probably indicates a line number where this approximately happened. OK, good. What might your user see in this case? Still nothing. OK, so still nothing. We're still in this exceptional state, and our user still sees nothing. They're just sitting there going like this, and nothing's happening, and wondering why nothing's happening. So this isn't great. It's fine, but it's not great. Uh, other than the thing that was identified before, we're not catching specific kind, We're not catching other more general kinds of exceptions. So there might be others that are raised, which is, is fine. It's fine. Is there anything else technical that can go wrong with this code? Yeah, OK, so I don't think there's anything else that can go wrong with this specific code. OK, good. Let's move on to number four here. So number four is uh, pretty similar, again, to the last two examples. I'm just going to move over here a little bit so we can see what this is doing. The catch statement here is logging, and then it's throwing the exception again. So inside the catch statement, we're, we're re-throwing this, this exception that we have caught. So I'm going to give you two minutes. This is very similar to the last couple of examples. OK, so I'm picking on team 12 this time. This code is really, really, really similar to the last couple of examples that we've seen, but it's subtly different. There's one extra line here where we're raising the exception. We're just catching something and then immediately throwing it again. Uh, so team 12, what, is, what do you see? You're the dev here. What do you see? OK. So we can still see the error being printed out here. This logger is going to probably print out a stack trace for us. We'll still see something in logcat. Good. What about with the exception itself being thrown again? What do you think might happen here? For the exception being thrown. So here I'm just throwing the exception again. What might happen at, at this point? OK. OK. Yeah. So that actually answers both questions here. You're, you're going to see as a dev, you're going to see something in your log. You're also going to see your app crash, probably. Your user will also see the app crash. Uh, do you think they can fix the problem based on seeing the app crash? I, I guarantee that you've all seen Android apps crash now. With those messages that you see, can your user do anything? You could try to reopen it, I guess. I think that's an option, but there's no solution to the problem. OK, good. And given that there was not really anything else that can technically go wrong with the last couple of examples, I'm going to get you off the hook here and just say, no, there's nothing else that can really technically go wrong here. We're still catching that specific exception. But now, instead of it being suppressed and held back by this catch that we've got, all exceptions are just being re-raised back up to the next layer. OK, let's move on to number five. So number five is, uh, is something different. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to discuss this. The difference here, I'm just going to describe it. The difference here is I'm not raising the specific exception that was raised to me. I'm going to put this in some context. Let me go back to number four here. In log and throw, I'm catching a specific exception, but let me, let me, let me put these classes into context. This is your logic layer class. The risky behavior is your persistence layer. 
it raises an HSQLDB exception. The code that's here now is throwing an HSQLDB exception again. So it catches it, it prints it out in the log message, and then it just throws it again to whoever happens to be calling us, which is our presentation layer in this case. Now, in number five, in wrap, I'm still going to say that this is specific exception. E, so I'm going to change that. I think that I printed this out to say illegal argument exception, but I'm going to change that to be, uh, wow, it was none of those things. Why is this so different than what I have printed out? Well, it's close enough. You can watch me type. OK, so this is what I want it to look like. This is what I want it to look like. I'm, I'm, I, I've, I have to be honest, I'm really baffled about when I changed this, because I was like, I've got all these Java files, and I just concatenated them all together and put them into a markdown file to generate this. So I don't know how and when I made the change. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Let's look at it this way. So we're catching that specific exception from our persistence layer, but now we're re-throwing something completely different. And what I might do is this. I might put E inside of that new custom exception that I've created. You got two minutes. Please talk about this. And then we'll get back together again. Case. OK. You good? Yep. OK. OK, so let's get back together. This time I'm picking on, uh, I'm picking on team four. And uh, I'm going to add, I'm going to add something here. I'm doing a bad job of this adding after I've asked you to talk about it. So we're thinking about this in terms of this is our logic layer. So we're calling uh, methods in our persistence layer that are in risky behavior. But the thing that's calling us is our presentation layer. So what has invoked this method that's called method is something in our presentation layer. So our user has tapped on a button. This method is being invoked ultimately as a part of that. And because we've marked that as throws this custom exception now, our code in the presentation layer has to handle this specific kind of exception, whatever our custom exception is. OK, so team four, what do you as a dev see in this exceptional case? So yeah, so something very similar to the last ones. We've got this handling specific exception. We're going to see this in our, our log somewhere. Debugging, same. It's basically the same. Given this code and then extending, so now I know that I constrained this before to only this code, but now extending to you've got a presentation layer that's sitting around this. What can your user see? What might they be able to see? Uh, so the throwing the custom exception is going to be handled in the persistence layer, basically translating the logger dot there for the user to see in some way. Right. So because we're being forced to handle this exception in our presentation layer, we have to catch custom exception. That means that the code we're writing can do different things based on what kind of exception it's catching. So let's say that specific exception here is integrity constraint violation exception. So some, something like that that's coming from your persistence layer. You've got a connection between two objects, and you're, you've got a duplicate key or something. If you can throw a specific exception that is in your domain model, you know, missing relationship between student and course, your user interface can catch that custom exception and change its interface to con convey that information to your user. So what they can start to do to correct the problem that they have encountered. The last part I'm just going to answer for you. There's nothing technically that can go wrong with this code uh, as it is right now. OK with that? We're good? OK. Let's move on to, uh, to another example here. So this is uh, called with resources. And I'm just going to make that. Oh, boy. What has happened? Uh, I'm just going to open up this. 
And I'm just going to scroll down because that's literally what's in front of you. I don't know why I'm trying to open up the Java file. So here's uh, example six. Uh, this is different now. This is, again, quite different from the last couple of examples now. This is still our, this is our persistence layer now. This is code that's in our persistence layer. I am, in this method, acquiring resources where I wasn't acquiring resources before. I'm doing most of the things here that I was doing before, so I'm catching a specific exception and then raising a custom exception. I'm wrapping it, and I'm trying to give the caller something more meaningful that they can do. The main difference is that, uh, that we're acquiring some resources here. So with that in mind, what I'm going to ask you to do is focus on this question here. Now we're moving to, can anything else technical go wrong with this code? The answers to the above questions are effectively the same as what they have been for the last couple. There's a bug in this code, is what I'm trying to say. There's a bug in this code. Take two minutes and see if you can find it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the team that I'm calling on this time is, uh, is Team 7. This is a subtle bug. If you weren't able to find it, don't, don't panic. It's, it's OK. This is quite a subtle bug. Uh, but Team 7, what, what, where's the bug? Uh huh. Right. Uh huh. Right. Exactly. When we throw an exception in Java, we interfere with control flow. Throwing an exception immediately goes back to the caller, and the caller either has to handle or rethrow the exception. We never come back here, though. We're not coming back here. If we don't close our accept, we don't close our connection before we raise the exception. The connection's still open, and it's just hanging out, and it's just waiting there. And this is a resource leak, so we're leaking connections here. This is subtle. This is starting to get into the weeds of Java specific stuff. Yes, yes. Isn't there also a finally? There is a finally, but exceptions can still happen in finally blocks. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, in fact, closing a connection can raise an exception. Y yeah, yes. <laughs> so there's try catch finally, and finally is something that can be executed. So this, thank you for pointing that out. If I did this, if I did this and I put a finally block on this try, then we do actually come back here and close the connection. But if an exception is raised in the finally block before we can close the connection, then it never happens. Yeah. OK, so that's good. OK, thank you, Team 7. The last example I have is not uh, for you to, I'm not going to ask you to look at this example other than for me to tell you about it. Uh, related to the finally block, uh, and in, in fact, I'm going to call this as a more reliable version of what the finally block is trying to do. Java introduced this idea of try with resources, and it changes the try. Uh, definition just a little bit. There's parenthesis here, so try and then parenthesis. And then you open something, you have a resource, and this connection class implements a, an interface that's called closable. And try with resources will auto close connections. So as you're exiting the try block, whether it's being uh, exited because of an exception being raised or because you're just leaving in normal circumstances, the thing that implements closable there will be closed automatically on your behalf. So this code won't, in theory, leak resources in the same way that the previous example does, even with a finally block. All right. OK. So my advice here is 
going to generally be catch the most specific type of exception possible. If you have to have a try catch block, my advice is catch the specific thing that you're expecting to catch and just let everything else be raised. Yes, it results in a crash of your app, but it, it gives you a better idea of what's going on when you're trying to debug issues that you have with the code. If you can handle an exception, and handling an exception means like possibly just wrapping it into some other kind of exception. Handling it might mean I can fix it myself, but that's not usually the case. If you can catch it, catch it, but only if you can do something about it. If you can't do anything about it, like there's no reason for you to re-throw it, or there's, I'm sorry, there's no reason for you to wrap the exception in your own custom error type just let it be thrown. So just have your method marked as throws or just re-throw the exception yourself. And then clean up, after your, clean up after yourself. If you're going to be opening connections yourself, you're not using something like a connection pool or a connection manager, make sure that you're using things like try with resources to help with that. All right. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to ask you to give all these sheets back, the one that have user error messages. I'm going to ask you to give those back to me. Not right now, but before the end of class, please. If you want to keep these code printouts, please be more than welcome to keep them. But otherwise, I'd like to uh, politely ask you to recycle them on your way out if you don't want them. We're going to do this error thing next time. I want to get the ball rolling on uh, the reviewing your, your iteration um, before the end of class. So we'll do this activity next time. So please return those, uh, those papers to me. All right. So we, uh, we're at this point now where you've, you've done iteration two. Uh, whether you're happy about it or not, I don't know. But you had to deliver it. You had to deliver it. You had to give something. It's time then to start immediately working on, on uh, iteration three. One of, this, uh, one of the ideas that agile methodologies frequently describe is the idea that you're learning about stuff as you're building things. The stuff that you're learning about is like the academic, what I'm going to tell you, but it's also, this is the sort of thing that happens in the workplace when you're working on a project with a team. There are technical and non-technical things that you're learning about as you're building a project. At this point, you should feel like reasonably comfortable writing Android code, where at the beginning of the term, you probably had no idea what any of the classes were in Android's hierarchy of classes. You now have more experience writing unit tests and using things like JUnit to run automated testing suites. You're also able to measure test coverage where you weren't able to do that before. You now have some experience integrating relational databases into an application. You also have a better idea of how to work with your team. The way that your team works or doesn't work, the way that your team works how you communicate with each other, the kinds of problems that you're having, and hopefully ways around some of the problems that you're having. And what you as a team are capable of delivering. So given the constraints of a time boxed iteration, what are you actually able to deliver before the end of that unit of time? Given what you have learned, it's now reasonable to start thinking about making changes to the product and project that you had originally envisioned as part of this course. As you get from one iteration to another, taking the time to think about what you can change and then actually making changes to it can help, be, help you be a little bit more successful going forward. Some of the things that you can think about changing are things like the process. And as we finish the last iteration, this is one of the things that I asked you to do with your team is just try to think about like what was going well with your team, specifically around um, the process. 
There's technical stuff that you can start doing. So maybe this is an opportunity for you to adopt a specific code formatting tool for your code so that you have some consistent looking uh, code. But there's also non-technical stuff like changing or dropping user stories. Part of iteration three is identify the user stories that you didn't finish in iteration two and add more to that pile. Yes, that's something that we're asking you to do, but that doesn't mean that you can't change the user stories that you've decided to do. It might be the time for you to change or drop features. User stories are pretty granular, but you've got a bunch of features that you said you needed for this vision, it might be an opportunity for you to say that's not reasonable anymore, given the time constraints that we have. And if you're dropping features, maybe that means you can't actually meet the vision that you said you were going to be able to meet in the first place. Normally, this stuff would be done with a client. You'd be working with your client. Our contract is ending. We're not going to be here anymore. What should we work on to change about what it is that we're trying to build so that we can all be happy at the end of this contract? You got a few minutes left. What I'd like you to do as a team with your team is review the vision. Take a look at the vision that you have in your repositories and decide fairly quickly if you can actually meet that vision. And if you can't meet that vision, what do you need to change about it? If you need to change your vision, change your vision, change it, change the document, change it in your version control repository. <laughs> All right, so uh, I will let you keep talking, but just a quick summary. Uh, what I'm hoping that you're able to do at this point is to, to take what we've done by going through all these exception examples and start to think about how you might take your own kind of specific persistence layer exceptions, translate them and wrap them into something else in your logic layer, and then in your persistence layer, handle those specific exceptions so that your user can do something about what it is that you are telling them is wrong with what they've done. We're going to take a look at uh, how users can see errors next class and then i'm hoping that you're able to make some meaningful changes to your project as you have seen fit based on the time constraints that you've got going forward i will see you all on thursday bye everyone <laughs>